In this video, I'd like to have a look at the extent to which the Greek gods were anthropomorphic. And there are two main aims. I want us to be able to define the keyword anthropomorphism and also then to think about the extent to which the Greek gods were anthropomorphic. Also having a look at where there were exceptions. So if we break down the word anthropomorphism, we have got anthropos, human, and morphe, form. So we're talking here about when the Greek gods are like humans in form. And this can apply to both the appearance, the physical appearance, but also it can apply to their behavior and their emotions. Um, we see a lot of the latter when we're studying world of the hero. I'm sure you'll be able to think of some examples from the Odyssey or the Iliad where the gods are behaving like humans. So in this video, what I'd like to do is focus on that first bit where they are anthropomorphic or not in appearance. So if you go to Greek art, you'll find that there are loads of examples that you can use to prove that the gods look physically human in sculpture. They can even be seen doing quite human tasks as well. So Aphrodite on the left here is seen bathing, although I also accept that is part of her cult practice. We've got a very young looking Apollo at the centre who is playing with and observing a lizard on a tree. And on the right, a rather unique representation of Heracles, uh, this time in his childhood. So we're seeing examples of the gods here at different ages. That is not to say, however, that the gods still aren't shown with power uh, and, and much more superior to that of ordinary mortals. So here are two examples that prove that. On the left hand side, you've got a representation of Apollo shown at the apex of the west pediment of the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. As he's at the apex, he's much taller than everybody else there. You can see how heavily defined his muscles are too. And he has an outstretched arm to show that he is presiding over this scene, which happens to be a centauromachy, a battle between centaurs and lapiths from the wedding of Perithous to Daedemir. And Apollo here is shown in his divine role as god of law and order, trying to bring an end to all of this chaos. On the right hand side, we have the god of Artemisium, debated whether this is Zeus or Poseidon, but nonetheless, the god is shown in a powerful stance and in the act of hurling either a trident or a thunderbolt to deliver some divine justice to a deserving mortal. There are exceptions, however, to the gods appearing like humans. On the left here, we have Achelous, the river god. He is part man, part bull. And then perhaps more commonly known to you is Pan on the right hand side, who is part goat. However, we can also have certain epithets of the gods that are also represented in different forms. So whilst we have Panhellenic Zeus in his human form, we also have his epithet Zeus Melikios represented in snake form. Um, and this is due to the fact that this is a chthonic role that Zeus holds um, associated with this epithet. And you can see there that on the votive relief, we have got people actively worshipping him in this um, particular aspect. I have done a separate video on epithets if you would like to know a little bit more about this. As well as Zeus Melikios, we also have a localised version of Demeter um, in Arcadia that is represented with the head and hair of a horse. And there grew out of her head images of serpents and other beasts. And the Greeks are quite happy to have these contradictions, to have their pan-Hellenic versions of Zeus and Demeter, and then to also have running alongside epithets in different form or localised versions as well. There are also aniconic images. So in Paphos, Aphrodite is represented uh, in cult form via a rock. You can see it on the right there. Uh, and we know that the function of this rock was, was worship or intended worship from the coin at the center. Um, one of many that shows an outline of a temple and inside we can see the rock in place of a cult statue. We also see aniconic images referred to in Pausanias' description of Greece, 
when he says that at Pharii there was water sacred to Hermes and he goes on to talk about there being square stones 30 in number each of which is called by the name of some god and he says at some more remote period all the Greeks alike worshipped uncarved stones instead of images of the gods um, it's also thought as an extra example that the Corinthian capital inside the temple of Apollo at Bassae in place of a cult statue of Apollo may also have been an aniconic image. To complicate matters, however, literature does refer to the fact that the gods seem to have more than one form and a form which they use when they want to appear to mortals. So Euripides in his play The Bacchae has Dionysus say, I have exchanged my divine form for a mortal one, suggesting that along the lines of the Zeus and Semele myth, it might be too dangerous for the gods to appear in their true form to mortals. Similarly, in the Odyssey, we see Athene using lots of disguise when she appears to mortals. In book 13 here, she has been previously a young shepherd boy, and then we're told that she altered her form to that of a tall and lovely woman. So it's a little bit more complex than simply saying the gods are anthropomorphic in appearance on the whole, with a few exceptions, because then we also have this idea of them having to disguise their true form when they appear to mortals. Later philosophers also start to challenge the idea that the gods look human and say that they essentially only look human because we have made them in our own form. And he famously says if horses or oxen or lions had hands or power to paint and make the works of art that men make, then horses would give their gods horse-like forms and oxen ox-like forms and so on. So to summarise what we've just seen, the Greek gods were depicted in human form in art. They were still shown as having powers superior to that of mortals, however. There were some exceptions to the physical aspect of anthropomorphism with Pan and the river god Achelous, as well as certain epithets of the gods, such as Zeus Melikios and localised versions such as our Demeter with the horse head from Arcadia. We also had some aniconic images such as Aphrodite from Paphos. Literary evidence further complicated the issue by raising questions over true form and whether the gods are required to use disguise when they appear to mortals. And finally, we do have some philosophers such as Xenophanes reminding us that the Greek gods are only anthropomorphic in form because humans make them so. And if you're interested more in that philosophy element, there is also a separate video on that on the playlist.